start streaming. Here we go. We are live. Let's just wait for some people to join and then we'll explain what's going on. Sounds good to me. What up, everybody? Can you guys hear me okay? Hi, Space Builder. Can you hear me okay? We are about to talk about some really cool stuff. You are first. What's I'm up, people? first? <laughs> I'm reading the comments. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I have a special guest here today. This man right here was my former squad leader. <laughs> he dealt with Carl himself, but that's not what we're here about. Um, oh, man. He was my former squad leader in the 101st Airborne. We're both combat engineers, but this man right here is doing something special that I've never seen anyone talk about on YouTube, let alone a live stream. So without further ado, this is my friend Jad, and he will explain what he does. Hello, everybody. So uh, I used to go by the handle Jad the Rad. I don't do that so much anymore. Uh, currently, I am an instructor over in um, Fort, Leonard, Fort Leonard Wood area, which is home of the Corps of the Engineers. Uh, I am an instructor for a course known as the Combat Engineer Heavy Track Course, which also which also produces the uh, Bravo 6 ASI, where you are certified on the JAB, which is the Joint Assault Bridge, the ABV, which is the Armored Breaching Vehicle, and the AVLB, which is the Armored Vehicle Launched Bridge. There you go. I've seen a lot of people on YouTube talk about it, but this man lives that life. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so how exactly... So is this, are these vehicles only for combat engineers? Or can infantry get in on them? Or how does it work? Like, who gets to drive all these vehicles? <clears throat> so for right now, yeah, it's only exclusive to combat engineers. In fact, it used to be uh, an MOS uh, in the 80s, 90s, and I think it stopped in the early 2000s. Um, I think it was somewhere along the lines of like a 12 Fox used to be the operator for the AVLB, um, which is the M60 chassis with the bridge on top of it and everything. And and they decided to stop treating that as an MOS and allowing combat engineers to do that asset or do that aspect of it, essentially. So um, our first question already, what does a combat engineer even do? A combat engineer, their job is to create lanes blow stuff up and they pretty much are the support element for uh infantry so whenever infantry needs to get somewhere combat engineers will make sure they get there okay yeah absolutely yeah you want to go in more in on that well i would even argue like the the most political answer we could say is as a combat engineer is we do three things we do mobility counter mobility and survivability uh, mobility is things such as breaching obstacles, whether it be we are clearing a path such as route clearance, which we've done in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, back in early days of uh, World War II when we stormed the beach of Normandy, that's another one. Uh, counter mobility would be things such as emplacing obstacles to either deter or um, stop an enemy. And survivability would be things like a lot of the uh, infantry uh units platoons battalions all that stuff like that they they work hand in hand we work hand in hand with them on doing things such as you know performing raids or assaults or whatever the case may be now as far as so to simplify everything you teach people how to drive the tank with the bridge on it yeah even even more than that so like with which which each of those vehicles right so we have the ABV, which is essentially an M1 Abrams without the turret on there, and it's got two Miklek tubs that shoot rockets and, and it has a, a clearing line charge. And then, of course, the jab and the AVB, or the AVLB, excuse me, they are both um, the bridging assets that clear gaps, rivers, creek beds, whatever the case may be, tank ditches, right? More, more for conventional warfare. The jab, which is the joint assault bridge, is actually supposed to be replacing the AVLB uh, just because of the fact it can't keep up with the force. Um, it's <laughs> To put it in perspective, the difference between the jab and the AVLB, the AVLB has a diesel engine that goes 775 horsepower, which like a top speed of like 30 miles an hour. But with 
the ABV and the Jab, they both use the same engine as the M1 Abrams. It's a 1,500 horsepower turbine uh, engine, not a diesel engine. And so that can go up to top speed around 40 to 45 miles an hour, just okay. depending if you're going down a hill or anything. So the Jab is supposed to replace the AVLB, but as of for now, we're still keeping the AVLB um, just because of everything that's been going on lately. So, Okay, so as we know, President Biden in the United States said... We're going to be giving tracked vehicles, tanks over to Ukraine. Correct. Now, you don't have to talk about things. You know, can you talk about, did you, did you work with the Ukrainians? Did you? Yeah. So, um, President Biden had requested everybody to include other members from NATO, such as France, Germany, uh, the UK. They all trans, uh, are, are sending tanks over for Ukraine to do their counteroffensive or whatever it is that they're, that, you know, to, to reclaim their country essentially is what they're doing. Um, when we got the call, and by the way, I mean the whole group of instructors and I were talking about us going to Ukraine to support it. Long story short, I called their bluff saying, there's no way that that's it. That's BS. I don't, I don't buy that at all. I'll throw my name in, in the hat, you know, and they said, all right, you're going. So I was like, Oh crap, I'm going to Ukraine. And then I was like, oh crap, I'm going to Ukraine. And so after I fi figured out a couple more information, uh, you know, for what the mission was and who I was going with and everything, um, I wasn't necessarily going to there. I was actually going to be training um on a on a uh a, a NATO country, you know, across the pond. And I would actually train uh, some operators on the AVLB, which is the some of the track vehicles that President Biden had requested to give to Ukraine. Okay. So what was a so pretty much you you were working with the Ukrainians? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I had a couple of interpreters actually that were also uh, from some of the first uh, cities and towns that were invaded uh, last year when it, when everything happened. And, um, you know, I would hear all about how they became an interpreter working over, uh, you know, with NATO and everything. And it was it was very interesting. And I learned a lot from them as I was doing it. But more importantly, my interaction with the Ukrainian soldiers was something I had never experienced, especially where uh, if anyone who's served in Iraq or Afghanistan have worked with both the Iraqi and the Afghani militaries, um, not to say anything bad about them or anything, but their the way their their drive and attitude when it came to training was far different than what I have ever experienced from anybody uh, across the pond, and by that I mean over the Atlantic. Uh, they were very ener energetic, enthusiastic about everything. They as soon as they saw what we were teaching them, they're like, "All right, day zero, I want to launch this thing. Let's go!" And I was like, "Pump your brakes, kid!" Like. <laughs> Let me show you a couple of things so you don't die, you know? So, so, that's, so that's interesting. You know, I've never actually heard that comparison. So you're saying compared to working with Afghanis, Iraqis, the Ukrainians seem to be well, like really motivated and really are trying to absorb what we are teaching them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they, I, I get a bunch of kids who come from the engineer basic officer leader course. Uh, which basically is like if if you want to be an officer uh, for the for the Corps of Engineers and stuff like that, you you must go through Ebolic, and that's all at Fort Leonard and everything. And so a lot of the questions that I get from from them, they're all mind you, they're all graduates, like they all have college degrees, and they'll ask me questions like, well, it, "Is it a twin turbo diesel engine in there?" And I'm like, "No, it's just a it's just a diesel engine in there." And it's like. So can it outrun like a Nissan Skyline? I'm like, no, like it's not that, it's not that type of horsepower, you know. But I'll get a lot of thoughtful questions and stuff like that from them, and, and they're they're really curious about how everything works. And they've also got previous uh, tank experience as well, which is what helped them, or rather, helped me teach them how to operate track vehicles as well as the AVLB. Okay. Um, and now I don't know for certain. If they are getting the AVB, or the, excuse me, the ABV, um, but I am aware of that they are getting M1 tanks. I know that much is clear, um, and I do know the exact amount of AVLBs that they are being provided for them because I trained <laughs> at the amount of Ukrainians for that uh, essential lot. But I can't disclose that either. Okay, so, so the Ukrainians 
are they tankers or are they combat engineers? The guys who are training on all this. So, stuff? so they have. So essentially, what they did was what we did back when we had the AVLB. Is essentially they've turned that into like its own MOS. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna essentially do with everything and everything AVLB. Um. I don't know if that means that they also have other like, combat engineers that are doing that because while we were there doing the training, uh, they were actually training other Ukrainian armed forces soldiers on combat engineer tasks such as the cratering charges and, and you know um, all the other type of breaching methods that we do for you know for urban breaching and things like that you know stuff that you would normally go through uh, if you were to go to like sapper school or or um urban mobility breachers course which is no longer a thing now so i think that it's going to be like its own mos so okay wow like i yeah. said i've never actually um we know a lot of people are out there training but you you're training them on such a specific task did they did they see the importance or like how unique this was because obviously they're seeing a bunch of american equipment and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. they're seeing a tank with a bridge on it when they first if saw any, that, were they like, "What?" Yeah. So when I first uh, when I first came to theater, I went to look at the vehicles and everything to make sure that they were up to standard before I could even train them because we had just got them from God knows where, and I didn't want to give them a crappy product essentially for them to train on if it would break down. And so while I'm out there extending and retracting the bridge and everything and, and making sure it's it's fully mission capable for training, everyone's looking at it like, wow, holy cow, like this is cool. <laughs> like They're excited about it and everything. And one of the things that I learned is that Ukrainians hate death by PowerPoint. I, I feel like anybody hates death by PowerPoint, but they love handouts. They love hands-on with everything. Um, if they're unsure about something that they're not afraid to ask directly, like to me or, or the other people that I was working with to do the training. Um, but yeah, it, it just, they, they loved it. They love Americans. They, ironically, they love the equipment and everything we have and the training we did. They said after we did our AAR, um, that, you know, they're very, they, they, they loved it and they wanted to continue us to see us do more training for them in the future. Well, this, it's an interesting thing because from an American soldier's perspective, it's like when we learn how to use a pencil, you got to learn, you got to do a PowerPoint. You don't even get a real pencil. You you get a fake one and then you get the real one and then you learn how to use it. These guys are, they're learning and then they go right into it. They go right into like a combat operation. So have they talked about um, any combat operation or like how they're like, we need to know all this stuff or they didn't get too into detail about that? No, from what I gathered, my mission was to, uh, ironically, I wasn't even, the only reason why I was even chosen to go on this mission is because the two civilians that work for the Department of the Army that were supposed to go, they didn't have any experience on the AVLB. So they had to come to me, being the SME or the subject matter expert, to talk with them uh, about... T essentially, I would teach them to help teach the Ukrainians, and I would assist in that as well. Okay, um, so the guys who were there, they're supposed to be like they're going to turn into the experts. So they would be you for Ukraine. Kind of. The whole purpose was like you were supposed to train the trainers. So what they told me was my only oper my only mission was to train them the operations of how to work the vehicle. I'm not, I don't go into depth as far as like any mission strategies, how to do things like uh, battle drill one alpha or anything like that. Like I don't teach them any strategy. I just teach them operation and maintenance. After that, that's, that's all on them. That was that was something I always wondered. I think a lot of people wondered is like, what is there a crossover between like what we know and what they know, and then we come together? But it sounds like with you, it's just this is how you do. This is we're gonna give you this. This is how you use this. Have fun, type deal. Yeah, pretty much. And uh, I don't want to say like when we started doing training, everything like we fed them to the wolves. Like the whole part of especially because I was trying to train them up and teach them the way that I do at the schoolhouse back in the states, and what we do is we do a crawl, walk, run. And by the time we were doing a crawl, they were already trying to run. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they're, they're also very quick to learn. So what ended up happening was I was only given about 10 days for training for them, which is around how much I would train, especially students back in the States, uh, 
at the Bravo Six course. Right. Um, we actually were only able to complete everything in a matter of seven days, which was insane because we had so much to teach them in so little time. But thankfully, because they've had a previous experience with things such as like uh, the M113, which is an armored yeah. personnel carrier. Uh, they were also learning about the Bradley and everything, and you know yeah. they, they're they're pretty quick to pick it up. And you have experience with the Bradley, from my understanding, when we worked together. Yeah. So before I came to Campbell and it was with the 101st, I was actually part of uh, the first infantry division where I was with. They used to be known as 11 uh, BSTB. It was a special troops battalion. And they kind of dissolved and became first engineers, but we would do things such as uh, gunnery with the Bradleys, if not doing uh, engineer qualification tables. Okay. So were a lot of those guys at all going from Bradley training to your training because it's all tracked vehicles, or they were just trying to keep everything separate? I think that they were trying to train them, cross-train them on as much as they could, such as Bradleys and everything. Uh, from what I was told with the interpreters that were there was like the last thing they came to before was actually how to do call for fire missions. So it's like we're trying to give them a whole military training package on everything, such as like, I don't know if they're actually doing nine lines or, or anything like that, but I do know that they are training them on how to do proper first aid, you know, how to do if you react when you're under fire, things like that. So. I'm assuming they're going to learn more than just about the AVLB, but again, like I said, my purpose was to only teach them about the AVLB. Okay. Um, as far as that, do you have any other, do you have random stories about working with the Ukrainians or something that sticks out to you? Or like your first encounter where you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm here with Ukrainians. Yeah, so uh, when I was there, <laughs> it was it's pretty wild um because they were always like don't take pictures nobody take pictures and everything else like that i mean like the ukrainian just like, out here with their phones <laughs> wow look at the bridge you yeah. know and uh we had one problem with the bridge where if anyone's ever dealt with hydraulics before anytime that there's air in the hydraulics it just seizes it's a problem well i had to get very dirty and muddy and everything to do it and i had the one of the ukrainians grab the tra uh one of the translators to come by and he Obviously, they don't know English, so they had the translator there, and he was like, I'm going to listen to you from now on because you know what you're doing. And so they actually gave me a couple patches uh, to trade with them. I, I figured I would come and show you guys. Yeah. Um, one of which, uh, one guy traded me for my deployment patch uh, were a couple of these patches here. This is essentially their logistic unit patch, which is like their supply, maintenance, and things like that. And then this is actually their engineer patch for essentially being a combat engineer. That's awesome. Um, they gave me a couple of their Ukrainian flag patches as well. I thought that was pretty cool. The Trident is obviously like their logo, their branding. The one I had to have, and I even gave them my uh, my American flag. The only flag I had on my uniform for it was this one right here, where it's just <laughs> like, it like I don't know who comes up with these patches, but the fact that they're able to wear these things makes it so cool. <laughs> so wait, were there a bunch of people wearing that? A bunch of Ukrainians? Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> me and another gentleman named Mr. Mac, uh, we got these patches. They were given to us. I was like, dude, that is so cool. I want that. Yeah. And uh, were they looking yeah, at I, you like, what's the big deal? <laughs> well, so no, not exactly. They they wanted a lot of our patches. Like they wanted my rank. They wanted my name tape. They wanted to do an exchange. And um, they also traded a couple of goods. Like I had one Ukrainian, uh, he came up to me and he was like, hey, can you get me like a, an army soldier toy or something like that? Um, because I really want to take it back home with me and give it to my kid to let him know that I was training with US Army. And um, I should, went to the PX that day. Should have given him an like, MRE. I, well, so they do have MREs over there. Okay. They've tried them, and they were like, dude, our Ukrainian arm MREs are way better than what the <laughs> Army has. Really? So, yeah. Oh, my god. Let's get to that real quick. So you, Ukrainian MREs, were they good? So I never got to try one, but definitely their packaging looks like as if they were, like, coming out of, like, a Gucci bag or, like, a mall, <laughs> basically. You know, they like, you had the Gucci bag from the mall type of experience. Like, it was that type of MRE. Yeah. But from what I gathered, from what I talked to some of the guys there – um, because some of the guys who were overseas that I was doing my training with were actually some of my students uh, from last year that were helping me with supporting the mission okay. logistically. And um, they would tell me about their MREs and everything. And like when you when you think about Europe and the food that they make, the 
even regardless if it's like an MRE or if it's something you get from like gas station food, like a, like a egg salad sandwich, the food is so much better than it would be in the States because they do certain preservatives that kind of make the food last longer. But it, because of that, it doesn't really taste as fresh as it would over here. Mm. And that was one of the biggest differences they told me about our MREs versus the Ukrainians. Did they hate our MREs? I wouldn't say they hated them. They were just like, eh, could be better, you know? <laughs> I think the number one thing that's like the selling point for the USMREs is, is the water heater because we're like the only one who does that. Yeah, well, they love that. So they were even doing pranks on each other with the MREs. So, oh, please tell because, you know, we love pranks at MREs. What were they doing? So the, the traditional hot sauce inside the MRE heater and like <laughs> it scared the heck out of me once because I was in the Humvee and I was a. Uh, I went to the commissary and I just got like tuna pack seat for lunch, you know, just to be cheap. And uh, I was eating the tuna packet and all of nowhere here, boom, right on my butt. I was like, what was that? <laughs> and then all of them started pointing and laughing at me. I was like, oh my gosh. Wow. So, dude, yeah. that, that's amazing. And then honestly, it shows the human aspect of the soldier. Like they're like normal. Yeah. They're just kids. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, is that some other stuff that I learned from them was that like um, a lot of people and I've seen this on my TikTok a lot is about like um, when it comes to things such as like uh, as far as like people being racist or, or inclusivity of other people, whether they they're whatever they identify, whether it be, you know, they're different genders or whatever the case may be. One of the things that I've noticed about what I talk with them about is a lot of them keep their traditional roles because you know, we talk about like people who do modern dating and they're yeah, yeah. Tra versus traditional and things like that a lot of the women there are very traditional sure. and if let's say for example the male the man if they're the breadwinner essentially you know it's almost like as if they were back in 1964 where it's like if you're the breadwinner essentially you kind of like have the final say in everything wow so it's pretty interesting to see how they kind of still have their traditional um roles and things like that especially with society despite them being an ever-changing culture you know because they're still you know they have modern stuff they've got cars laptops smartphones all the other stuff that we all have or the technologies we have it's just i don't want to say they're like amish people about no. it but like you know they're, they're kind of they're kind of dated back on their on how they do their dating and, well, and, and things socially well here's a point i mean in the u.s military we have combat arms open to women Mm -hmm. so like do they did you have any female instructors out there and were they just like oh like were they okay with that or it wasn't no so uh they they don't have from what i was talking with them they don't have anyone anybody in female roles that i saw uh over there um i've seen like TikToks again, I... and youtube videos of like a female ukrainian like driver or whatever but i've never seen like a yeah. combat mos yeah i honestly i could not tell you um I have seen some of those video videos myself because there was one uh, Ukrainian soldier video that was talked about amongst them was that this lady used to be um, a doctor or something like that. And then now she became uh, a Ukrainian soldier, uh, you know, armed forces soldier. And they would see videos about her, uh, you know, doing stuff. And but that was as far as it gone. None of, none of the uh, um, people that I trained essentially were female. The only ones I had that were female were my translators that were there. So okay, um, but even from the U.S. military perspective, because even like you could have female calf scouts who'd be training Bradleys. Like, did they? Do you know any interaction between them and working with female U.S. soldiers in the combat role? No, I can't say that I have. Okay. Although, I'm like, just for curious because again, it's weird in every culture. It's like because we're so used to it, and it's like now it's a thing. Like we're learning how to make it a thing, make it effective. But from yeah. another country, it's like, what? Yeah, no, I, I completely understand where you're coming from with that. From what I saw, like, even if, like, even if there was, um, like, female U.S. soldiers doing, like, combat engineer stuff, because they were doing that off to the side where we do our own training, there wasn't anything that, like, they were like, okay, cool, this is, this is happening. This is sure. what's going on now, you know? So it wasn't anything, like, out of the ordinary or they didn't think was out of the ordinary for them interesting so so as far as the assault breacher vehicle that's one of my favorite vehicles in the u.s military um yeah 
What would you say um, is a misconception about it? Is it overhyped? Is it underrated? What's your feeling about the that vehicle? I feel like with tensions, whether it be with China, Russia, whatever, I feel like the ABV is an even more critical vehicle now than it ever was before. Um, and just so everyone knows, Jad knows he's an instructor. He know he understands it. Yeah, I'm an instructor at the Combat Engineer Heavy Track course. I teach this vehicle for a living. Um, what we've noticed, especially when it comes with uh, soldiers, especially stateside, is that we're getting like every class that we get moving forward. Um, we're, we're full of we're full of full capacity essentially. And so, what I've also noticed is that. Uh, armored units that have the ABV with them and everything, they are taking these vehicles on rotation, whether it be to go to Korea, whether it be to go to Poland, um, wherever uh, they, you know, wherever these vehicles they think that they may be needed because of tensions and everything else like that. Um, I feel like now this vehicle is even more important than it ever was before because back then when they first had the ABVs, Marines actually used to own them. Yep. Now they don't have a tank battalion anymore. In fact, the army bought their vehicles and now we have them exclusively. Um, they would use them to clear IEDs and things like that over there. Whereas now we're fighting more conventional. We're going to use it to breach wire mine obstacles and things of the such. And who knows if that may lead us to World War Three or not. Which is, I, I, I've talked about the uh, assault breacher vehicle history, how the Marines literally were the masterminds of this. And then the army is like, yep, we'll take that. And then the Marines yeah. got, the Marines got rid of all their tanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty funny how it happens. So over at the heavy track course that I teach originally, like I said, uh, Marines used to have them now and they no longer do. Um, the army would work hand in hand with the Marines on training uh, both branches of, of military on the AVB. And then, of course, we had the AVLB at the time. Um, and there were talks about having the Wolverine, but, you know, the Wolverine was just a really bad version of the jab at that point. Um, and so they never did any training with that. So, but since we've taken on the Marine vehicles, actually half of our vehicles have the smoke generators that are on the Marine variants. <laughs> So, so one of the things we teach one of the students and, uh, someone's like, someone said without giving away military secrets, this is actually like a known fact. Army vehicles don't have smoke generators, at least the ones that we have, um, in the force, they have them in, um, our motor pool, essentially the schoolhouse, but like army vehicles or army ABVs don't have, uh, smoke generators on them. And the way the smoke generator would work is, is attached to the fuel line. There was a nozzle that you wouldn't you flip it up it sprays fuel onto the engine because it's so hot. And because it's not burning at the same rate as if it was under pressure inside a combustion chamber or anything like that, what it does is it smokes into white smoke. And that's typically for diesel, not JP8, which is a different type of fuel that we use. Okay. Um, the Marine variants have that. And so since we've bought them, if any force units have them there, that is, it's a Marine vehicle essentially at that point. So. Wow, so you guys, you just see those marine vehicles you're like thank you so was that the main difference was the marine version it just had the smoke variants on it or? uh there was a there was a couple more difference uh differentiations such as um they had uh like if you've you ever been a part of a rock clearance platoon they would have mine rollers and stuff like that yep they have their own version for the marines uh we did not have that we only had the combat dozer blade or the full width mine plow okay so is that thing from my understanding, the British invented that. I don't know if you know anything. Yeah. So the company, I want to say Pearson or something like that. The the UK created the front end equipment for uh, the AVB, and the Army just kind of took that and and rolled along with it. Okay. And made it their own essentially. So, is that plow seriously? It does work. Oh is my it? gosh. Okay. So. And this is one of the things that I talk to people all the time. If you look at the AB, uh, if you look at the ABV, right, there are three skis on the front of it, right? A lot of people will tell you, oh, yeah, that's to, in case it steps on the mines. It's just another layer of defense. That is complete BS. That is not true. The whole point of those skis are so that way, if you look at um, the steel tines, essentially the, the, the spikes, essentially, that go into the ground, uh, 
it's designed to only go about two feet into the ground. What it does is it keeps it from actually digging deeper into the ground and getting stuck. Got it. Uh, it's like the equivalent of you putting your mouth on a curb and someone curb stomping you <laughs> and your jaw just like staying in place. Yeah. yeah. Jeez. So, That's a yeah. Good... <laughs> <Pretty much. laughs> it's the only, only way we can uh, describe yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. But that's cool. I yeah, a lot of people don't realize it was a Marine British collab that the army stole. Yeah. And then for well, my so, sorry. I would say I wouldn't say they stole until until the Marines are like, Hey yeah, you guys can have our idea now. This you know, we'll sure. we'll sell you our vehicles and go from there. But yeah, they've pretty much uh collaborated that idea for sure. From my understanding, the army never actually got to use it in theater. They used it. They tried to use it. I know the Marines actually used it, and it worked. And then the army tried to use it for a week, and it never just got used in Afghanistan. I think. I don't know if you know about that. So, I have not seen. I have not heard anything or seen anything that was in, that it was being used in Afghanistan. The only thing I thought of was that it was being uh, that I had seen anything of was it being used in Iraq. And the whole okay. point of it being used in Iraq at the time was um, to clear IEDs out, out in the roads. And that's what they used the Miklik for was to just shoot the rocket so many meters that way with right. with a 14 meter uh, spread on the charge. And um, it makes sense that they wouldn't use it in Afghanistan because from what I've, I haven't been there per se, but a lot of the people that I work with instructors have, have explained to me that like, it's very mountainous terrain, you know, it's like as if you were living in um, Colorado or if you were in the Rockies somewhere, you know, just the environment there is not that sensible enough for track vehicles to be there. Okay. So. Interesting. I kind of want to talk more about the uh, Ukrainian aspect. Yeah, I got a couple more things to show. Uh, yeah. What do yeah, you so I don't have the cigarettes, but they did give me cigarettes to give to the guys back to the States, and they said they love them. They're completely different. Okay. Um, they also gave me this uh, Ukrainian vodka <laughs> right here. I don't. It's called uh, Lemberg, and the way you can tell it's from Ukraine is because on the top it has the trident on the top. Yeah. And so that just lets them know, you know, that they... It's their homebrew vodka. I have yet to touch it. Did they just bring it with them? They're just like, here you go. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> they, they were completely cool with it. And uh, fun fact, yeah, you can transport alcohol, whether you're going cross country <laughs> or whatever like that. You just got to put it in your check baggage. You can't yeah. bring it on the plane, right, per right. se. And one of the other cool things they did for me was uh, they gave me a Ukrainian flag that was signed by them. Let me pull it out for you. Thank you. And they drew an AVLB on it. Oh, wow. So they put their unit name on there, which I can't read that, so I don't know what that <laughs> means. But they also drew uh, the Trident flag, and of course they all signed it, which I thought was pretty cool. That's dope. So, Damn. So I plan on getting that framed uh, yeah. in the near future. So. so as far as their military standards, were they like pretty lax? Like, Could they... Could they do whatever they want? It seemed like, like, you know, as a U.S. soldier, you can't put your hands in your pockets. You can't walk on grass. For the Ukrainians, so, it was just like, whatever. So, yeah, it was it was definitely very interesting with uh, training them uh, because, again, like, some of them would have, uh, there was one time one dude came up and he was wearing civilians. And I was like, <laughs> what happened? Did his dry cleaning just, like, not come in yeah. that day or, or what? Uh, and so... There was some guys that would essentially wear unbloused boots. They would wear their uh, beanie caps different ways and everything. And uh, one of the things was um, we had, and I don't, and not everyone is this way, but there were some big guys that were that, that were there, and they were more on the maintenance side than anything. When you say big, do you mean overweight or like? Jack? Yeah, like they, okay. they they were a little bit obese, um, but they weren't like one of those. Their job was as a mechanic, not necessarily as an operator or something like that. So right. I guess it makes sense, you yeah. know. Um, but one of the trainings that we were going to do was we were going to go over the escape hatch because the AVLB has an escape hatch at the bottom. And then when we saw them, we're like, we just looked at each other like, uh, maybe we'll skip this lesson. <laughs> so, <laughs> so oh, no. it was they... pretty, we were just like, okay, 
Yeah, this guy's not gonna even make it through if the vehicle flips over. Like, <laughs> he's just down at that point. Were they? Did they like laugh about it or just like whatever? Oh yeah. So yeah. like, whenever, so one of the big things because we would prank each other all the time. Like I said, the 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 um, with the the hot sauce inside the MRE heater, everything they would do all stuff like that. And so one of the things that they I told them not to do was whenever you live the lift the bridge up is to not smack the far side of the bridge. Mm -hmm. And if you did something weird is going to happen. Yeah. And so when they, one of them did, I would actually go up to one of them in the ear where we were doing the hand and arm six. I was go, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just like make them completely uncomfortable. <laughs> and so they started doing it to each other at that point. And it was it was a good time. We try to make it fun. That's cool. Yeah. Damn, I can't believe they knew. Who taught them how to do the hot sauce? MRE, did they I... watch? They, they must have watched one of my videos. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um... They, they have their own separate camp that they go to, so they're they're not like attached to like the army base per se or anything like that. Where I was training at, mm -hmm. um, but during their downtime, because you know they smoke, they have um, they take smoke breaks regularly, you know, just like anybody else would. So they have a lot of time to socialize, and of course, the interpreter is there to kind of talk back and kind of learn so much about them and everything else like that. That. You know, they would learn. Here's the weird thing. I tried to tell them a joke that uh, would have been funny in the States, but hearing it in their language, it would have been difficult to do. Because yeah. one of the things that the uh, interpreters told me is that, like, when it comes to their language and how they speak and identify things, everything has a gender. So what I mean sure. is, is that masculine, non-masculine. Yeah, so if yeah. I talk about water, they talk about it as a she, just as like you would talk about a boat being a she. Yeah. And so when I try to tell them a joke about some dude walking into a bar and stuff like that, <laughs> the way the joke would tell them was like, instead of me saying a dude walks into a bar, it would be translated as there was a bar and a guy happened to come inside. Okay. That was weird. It just kind of ruined the joke at that point. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. What, so would, like what if, was your icebreaker for the Ukrainians? Uh... I didn't have an icebreaker. I just kind of went in and just was like, oh, yeah, just, you know, <laughs> just being random with them, honestly. Yeah. yeah. So because I'm, I'm the same way back at, at, at work. Like, I'll just I tell people all the time. I'm like, I like, listen, if there's one thing you need to know about me, I'm the biggest bitch in the room. You got it. <laughs> and they would just all be like, what the heck is he talking about? What he's why is he saying that about himself? Yeah. He must have low self-esteem, you yeah. know, and just keep him off guard, you know? How'd the translator translate that? Was he just, did the translator ever look at you like, what? Well, so <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> so like, I would I would tell them like, I'm the biggest bitch in the room. And then the translator kind of looked at me for a second like, what did you just say? <laughs> and I said, yeah, go ahead and translate it. And she just pointed at me and goes, bitch. And everybody started laughing. <laughs> so I was like, oh, you guys know that word. Okay, <laughs> makes sense. Wow. Yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a very unique experience. I, I would... Maybe not unique, but unique in this because the equipment you're using is not that well known about or that not that it's not promoted. It's just not sexy. Yeah, no, that, it's a very fair point. Um, the only vehicle, only units that really have them is a small handful of active units. But most of the units that have them are either the National Guard or the Army Reserve, spe specifically the AVLB. Um, as I mentioned before, the jab is supposed to replace the AVLB. Mm hmm. Originally, we were what was going to happen is we would have around maybe uh, 14 jabs created in six months. But because of the pandemic that happened and everything, mm -hmm. now we're maybe getting one vehicle every quarter wow. of the year. Yeah, it, it's insane. So it like once the pandemic hit, not only did it like, uh, you know, ruin everything for everybody else in the world, but it also stopped chain supplies for the government and everything. And right. It, it you know it's just kind of been on a on a crawl lately so damn all right i mean if you have anything else to say that you can think of or that was the no, main man, gist if, is... if anyone has any questions or anything i mean i'm happy to answer them chat whatever anybody have a question over at the chat now is your time to talk to a combat engineer yeah, and just so i just kind of help uh if anyone has any questions i've been in the army for 12 years now I've had one deployment. I've been to Fort Carson, Fort Campbell, Fort Riley, Fort Leonard Wood. I am an instructor. 
So I also deal with trainees uh, in Tradoc. I've also got a lot of buddies that are drill sergeants and things like that. So um, if anyone has any questions of any kind, I'm happy to answer them. Anyone? Someone asks, is this a podcast? It's uh, more like an interview, I yeah, guess. Yeah, it's more just hanging out with my friends. Yeah, so I, I, for those that don't know, I used to be his boss. And there were crazy stories that even he and I could talk about. Like, for example, there, I, and he knows exactly what I'm talking about. One time he found a picket pounder. And our old platoon sergeant, <laughs> Wavy Jean Shoemaker, he was so, I don't want to say anal, but he was just very, like, uptight sometimes, right? And so one time, he asked me. He said, uh, "Hey, uh, where did where did Marcus get that uh, picket pounder from? Can he bring it in the office and give it to us?" And I was like, "Well, I'll call, but I don't think you'll like the answer." So I called Marcus and I said, "Hey, you got the, remember that picket pounder you found?" He said, "Yeah, you mean my picket pounder?" I was <laughs> like, "Yeah, uh, Sarge Shoemate wants it." He's like, "Well, he's gonna have to take it out of my cold dead hands." Click, and I was like. Yeah, it's not going to go well, bro. I'm sorry. I forgot about that. I was like, I'm not giving away something that I found that you want. Like, it doesn't, yeah. even though you're a higher rank, like, I don't care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I and, well, it, he, he was so dramatic about it because he was like, well, I'm going to have to probably call the MPs because that's actually private property because it's designed for the United States government and the metal that was for it was not produced by his hands. And he was just like running off about it. I was like, okay. <laughs> What do you want me to do about it? He said no. So you told someone me. asked, "What is a picket pounder? What is a picket pounder, Marcus?" It's the it's a metal tube. You ever see a fence and the middle part has the metal? You got to pound it down. It's like a metal tube that's hollow in the middle, and then you pound down those metal poles. Yeah. Uh, someone did ask, "What was your best moments in the service?" My best moments in the service. Uh, for me, it was. <laughs> Keep it clean. <laughs> uh, it was probably the times I did off post with some of the guys. Like, um, there was one guy, Marcus knows him. His name is Newhouse. We all went to Nashville together. And uh, we all would get super drunk. Like, I would get drunk with my soldiers and everything else like that. But, like, we did it as a group. So it wasn't like we were singling anybody out. And so there was one time I had got so drunk that I accidentally threw up on someone's shoes outside of the club in Nashville. And Newhouse, he would come by and take me up. He said, all right, man, you're good. You're done. We're gone. <laughs> and so we just came back to back to base. But that is probably one of my favorite times ever, honestly. So mm -hmm. I don't I don't know if I have it. My favorite time was getting out. No, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite time was li literally just telling funny stories in like our tents and our hooches i thought that the, that's like the only thing if i could go back and just hang out it would be we would just all hang out in a tent and just talk about dumb things that we did that was yeah. the most fun i think my favorite thing that you and i ever did with louis was when we did mtv cribs <laughs> do you remember that for the patreon if anyone wants to please by the way i'm demonetized so if you guys go to the pin link and go to my patreon i will post the video to my to the cribs video we yeah. have a, we have a cribs video I don't know if I'll yeah, post it, it on here, but if you go to my Patreon, we'll do that. It was a good time, though. That was probably one of my more. That was probably one of my favorite times in uh, on base, rather like during training and stuff. <laughs> so, any other random questions? Somebody said post driver. I've never been a driver. I wish I was. I I've been a driver once for like a week, then I got fired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a China spy. I'm just curious if it gets hurt when it's it's a blast. Right. I'm reading out loud. I'm an idiot. Yeah, good. Another question is, did you ever felt down? Just yeah. Have I ever been upset in the army? Yeah. <laughs> well, I was gonna ask you, Marcus. What was life for you after you got out? Because you had got out when I had went to Fort Carson in Colorado. Um, when I and yeah. you were doing stuff. I got out in 2016, and then the the night. That night when I finally got home and I was out of the army, I'm like, oh, when I wake up, I am not going to have any sense of direction. I'm not going to have friends to be there. And yeah. it, took, it took me about six months to like not be depressed and figure it out, Yeah, which is the same. Every single veteran who gets out, it takes a period of time before you don't know what you're going to do. 
But yeah. was, again, every veteran deals with that. It's nothing crazy, but it, it did kind of suck too. I did miss all you guys. Someone said, how much weight can an AVLB bridge layer hold? Uh, so <laughs> there are different ratings on the side of the AVLB. They're known as an MLC, which is a military load classification. And instead of actually saying the weight of it, it it's basically the number. It depends on the vehicles, of course, too. They'll have a specific MLC weight that they have. And the bridges can do different weights. It depends on the what they do to the bridge. But like originally with the M60 uh, AVLB, it came with a military class of 60. And then we've kind of upgraded it later on into an 85. And now the bridges that are also on the jab are a military load classification of 115. So, and again, that doesn't transfer to like any specific weight or, or, or tons or anything like that. It's just, that's the classification that it can hold. Um, is there, somebody said, this is easy. What's your favorite military vehicle? Assault. My, per, my personal favorite military vehicle. Um, if we're talking about in the army, I would say the, uh, Apache. I love the Apache. I think it's one of the most badass vehicles out there. That's if we're mine. talking about aircraft, I'm a sucker for the F-14. I hate that it's it's no longer in service. I wish it was still in and they continued that program, but I digress. Mine was also the Apache. Okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah Apache was fire, man. Seeing it at the in the 101st was like dream come true. Those, those guys are badass. Yeah. Is there another job that you would want to do while in the army? Not so much an actual job, but like a duty. MOS. Well, when you say the word job in the army, it's tough because you join as a combat engineer, but you have jobs. Like you're the driver, you're the yeah. armor. That's the way I see it. I, I've always wanted to be a combat engineer, but I wouldn't have mind to do some more desk work. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've only ever done frontline work, so that kind of broke my body. But mine was more working in an office. If I would have worked for an office for like five months, I think I would have stayed in the army. Yeah, so if I were talking about a different MOS, I would even go as far as doing a different military. Yeah. I would actually consider Space Force, Me honestly. Too. Um the the joke uh, or the meme of being a uh, space shuttle door gunner like yeah. that is always going to be the epitome for me. Yeah. Uh, but a different job in the military, you know, I would love to be the uh, guy who gets to uh, launch the Patriot missiles. That would be pretty cool. I think that like a Tango 13 or something like that. I forget. I don't remember the MOS, but I know it's like you sit in the back of a Humvee and there's a <laughs> rocket system on top. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's halo in real life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I want to be a Ranger. If I get in the army, nice. Bradley is the best tank. Is Someone a... said, would you ever want to do tankery? And if so, what job? Uh, um, no, me personally, no. No, I will say this much, right? If you decide that you want to join the military and you want to be working involving tanks, whether you want to be a mechanic or an operator or whatever like that, just know that there are also good jobs that pay good money when you get out for those jobs. I have a guy that I work with um, at the schoolhouse where he has never been a tanker, right? But he's able to work on those vehicles. They will look for people who have that tanker experience and they will hire them over someone who doesn't have that experience. Mm -hmm. So consider that, especially if that's something you want to do. I always tell people all the time, like if you're ever looking at joining the military or anything like that, join into something that's going to help you on the outside. So if you want to be uh, involved with uh, production of some sort, probably go public affairs or something like that, you know, or, or something to that level. Um, hell, go even psyops. You know, there's a lot of stuff you can do. I changed my original answer. I, I would have wanted to do psyops. Psyops, yeah, psyops is pretty cool. How would you transport two bridges worth of M1 Abrams over mountainous terrain in a country with little to no highways? You wouldn't. That's why uh, Afghanistan has never been conquered. <laughs> the simple <laughs> answer is you just wouldn't. You can't. Yeah. You could, yeah, but if you can't. <laughs> I wouldn't even I wouldn't even be asking that question. I would be I would probably be asking more of the lines of like how would I be able to transport two brigades of <laughs> M1 Abrams over uh 
flat planes just in because general. like <laughs> yeah in general just because there's there's so much that goes into vehicles that I, I tell people all the time like if they're sitting there they're breaking unless you're playing with them all the time they're gonna break down so would you like to just enjoy the time of the tank if possible instead just marching and would you like to be in the army for fun um any anytime i can get a ride i'll get a ride <laughs> if that's what <laughs> yeah. you're asking me i would love to hitch a ride <laughs> yeah no uh riding in a tank is a lot better than walking i tell you that much because <laughs> i remember when i first came to campbell you guys were telling me about how you guys had just got back from JRTC and you guys were walking like 13 miles yeah. one way for one mission mm -hmm. in the middle of the night and someone's NVGs didn't work. So they were holding on to the other person's backpack. So um, one thing I have noticed, especially if like you're concerned about promotion is in the mech world, it's a little bit slower to get promoted than it would be in the light world because in the light world, you make more of an impact being that dismount than you would be doing gunnery or something like that with like a Bradley. Mm -hmm. Like you stand so. out more. You can stand. Yeah, out. absolutely. And, and, the, and, you know, like the leadership role is a lot more, you do a lot more as a team leader in the light world than you do in the mech world. Okay. That's another conversation for another time. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, is it bad to join the military for the thrills and to take out enemies or is that normal? Uh, it's, it's a little bit of both, but it's people like to Hollywood. The mil it's, the military you only do your job like five percent of the time so. yeah i think for a lot of young people who join the military they relate their experience to what they find on like call of duty or halo yeah. or or whatever fps that they play these days and there's nothing wrong with that until it gets real you know because like you're like oh yeah man like i can't wait and teabag the other enemy when i go overseas and when you yeah. go overseas you're like what the hell am i doing here yeah. like Give me back to an office job, you know, like. Which is why I wanted to work in the office. Do you do yeah. you know your Abrams tank variants by any chance? Uh, there's only. Well, because somebody asked, what's the best Abrams? So, <laughs> I will say this. Um, like for example, if you look at what an M1 A1 versus an M1 A2 and an A3 tank look like, uh, the A1s are essentially the variants of that tank. So the A1 is going to be older than the A2 and the A2 is going to be older than the A3. One thing I can tell you about the A1 versus the A2 that is a distinct difference is, and we've used it on our ABVs as well, is that the suspension on the A2s are a lot more beefier than the A1s just because they're able to support more weight. And we have to do that because of the amount of equipment yeah. and the type of equipment that we have to carry on the vehicles. Okay. Uh, I get this question all the time. Does Airsoft help you train at all for the military? Yes and no. Yeah. Uh, as far as, like, if you're trying to practice communication, tactics, strategies, stuff like that on, like, a small uh, battle, you know, yeah, sure. Uh, especially if you're doing things like close quarters combat stuff. Um, but as far as, like, everything else is, like, logistics, preparing, yeah. uh how to conduct the training, things like that. No, it, it doesn't help in that aspect. Yeah. When when you're doing an airsoft match, you're not making sure Carl has a water canteen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or his dog tags in his shirt. Yeah, yeah. In the you army, know? you have to make sure you have a pencil before you go into combat operations. <laughs> yeah. In airsoft, you have to make sure mom paid the ticket. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, now for a really interesting question. What would be your favorite farming simulator game? For example, Minecraft. Mine's RuneScape. You know, I don't really play any farming stuff. I actually tried to play Farming Simulator 22. 22. I got so confused with what I'm supposed to do with the freaking plow. I just uninstalled the game. <laughs> Which is ironic, considering it's part of your job. But <laughs> Yeah, right? <laughs> if you join infantry, you will always be cleaning or in physical pain. Not a question. That was a statement. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, and we have a few more questions. Ask them. Uh, just watch a documentary on the Operation Red Wings and the brotherhood the Army has is drawing me into being a Ranger. Sure. That's the number one thing I miss. Um, me and Jad haven't worked together in forever, but I'm sure, I mean, we're like family now, and if we work together tomorrow, we'd fit right in and be just fine. Yeah. 
Operation Red Wings is uh, that operation that took place with Mark Lissettrell, right? Yeah, those were Navy SEALs, by the way. But I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Rangers, yeah. Navy SEALs, they're all a tight-knit group. Even regular military logistics corps. If you're a janitor with somebody, you're going to be friends with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> combat janitor. Yeah, combat janitor. Operation Broom something. Yeah. <laughs> Push Broom. Operation Broomstick. Oh, my God. Uh, what's the movie with that? What's the uh, movie? It was uh, Lone Survivor. Yeah. Great stuff. I worked with Fifth Group, and that was their favorite uh, movie. Yeah, I was very jealous about that time. I wasn't there for that, but I don't yeah. know what I was doing at the time, but... Y'all were doing some high-speed training with them at the time. Uh, would you rather drive a fuel truck near an active combat area, or would you rather be on guard duty in an ammo depot? Ooh, it depends on the combat area, but I'd probably <laughs> rather do the guard duty. Yeah, guard duty for sure, because, <laughs> you know, you I feel up. like with the fuel truck, it's just like <laughs> Sir, you're not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, yeah. you know, at that point. Guys, you'll uh, start to notice the people on social media who act like they want to do all the bad stuff, they're full of it. Anytime you can avoid a bad situation, you're going to avoid a bad situation. Anytime. Yeah. Um, spicy question. Would would be if you were in Axis Force, which military and company would you join? Uh, well, I'm a Romanian, so I would probably be in the Romanian mountain. Tenth, I think they actually have a 10th mountain. I'd be in the on the Romanian oh. side. My family okay, fought so, on the Axis side, actually. But. Yeah, on the Axis side, I would be... Would the Russians consider be counted as that? Because they for used half. to be part of... Yeah. yeah. On the first half. And then the second half, they came in and ah, you're demolished clever. them. You're clever. Yeah. Easy. Okay, okay. PTSD seems to affect a lot of vets. Any good places for them to go and help? The VFW and the American Legion are the most underused assets, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, I have not hi, Doug. seen that. I honestly, I haven't even been to a VFW since ten years ago. Honestly, yeah, and it was only for a Valentine's Day dance that no one showed up to. <laughs> you were the only. I I literally was. My buddy, he hyped it. He hyped it up and was like, "Yeah, there's this thing on Facebook where if we go to the VFW, there's gonna be a lot of bad girls there, and <laughs> oh, we'll have got, a good party time." And you got we were the only ones there. Um, do you think there will ever be an electric tank? So I can talk about this too because um, what the army is trying to do is by 2030 they're wanting to have a minimum of 25 percent, if not 30 percent of the force, uh, be remote. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is is that essentially take the ABB ABB ABV for example. What the army wants to do, and we actually have I have people that I talk to who are actually in the process of doing this, is they are trying to make the ABB. Uh, go to the last cover and conceal position means before you actually go to the breach site, the operator and the tank commander hop out of that vehicle, go inside of Bradley and in the back of the Bradley, instead of it having a hole where you can sit uh, people in and everything, there's actually computer screens, cameras, all kinds of stuff. And you're able to control the vehicle moving forward to the last breach uh, position. Do I think electric vehicles are a thing? Possibly, do I think in the near future? I don't foresee that happening for another thirty or forty years. That's a lot of uh, metal to move. Is the issue? Yeah, I don't think it it'll is. ever be one hundred percent electric, but it'll definitely be. There will be electricity in the vehicle. <laughs> well, it was, you know what's <laughs> funny is when I went to Carson after Fort Campbell, uh, the army actually came to Fort Carson to do a test of. Uh, a military vehicle on hydrogen. I don't know if that panned out or not, but it was like a really big talking point on the Army Times one time, and uh, there wasn't really much said after that. So, someone said best Army base, Fort Carson, hands down for me. Uh, Fort Belvoir, right? Isn't that the best near Washington? <laughs> I've never been there, never but been for there. me, I've heard good things about it. Like you can do things like uh, if you if you're a combat engineer. You can go to the 9-11 search and rescue team or whatever, and you That's can learn things such as, yeah, you can do things such as um, uh, EMT stuff. So like you would work as if you were like a medic on an ambulance, you'll also do search operations where like you have to use the jaws of life to kind of like get people out of buildings and things like that. Um, concrete saws for breaching, whatever the case may be. Um, 
that's one of the cool spots to do it but like you you have to be almost selected to go uh for something like that so uh, yeah uh, i need the jaws of life every time i go to mcdonald's someone said join up y'all the world needs you i just saw an i read an article the other day about how army is no longer uh so what they used to do right is when everyone talks about the, the military always trying to reach a quota type of thing um if they don't meet that quota they essentially no longer serve as a recruiter and it looks bad on their ncoer or their report card for lack of a better word and so they go back to the force well now what they're saying is because recruiting efforts are so low that they are no longer blaming the recruiter on the recruiting efforts they think it's the uh the way uh civilians yeah. and young adults view the military uh given the past couple presidencies going on and everything it's crazy well i won't talk about it too much but i just uh are you sending me a dm i actually just went on the first tour like as a civilian with the army up in indiana and there's actually somebody here that uh saw me speak oh really yeah nice. indiana rescue how, how did i do that was my first time i ever done that they just said go have fun and uh i learned a lot <laughs> i want to do a separate video talking about uh the younger generation what i learned and um it was fun, but yeah, I can see that how a lot of people don't trust the army, especially younger, the younger yeah. generation. Yeah, one hundred percent. Fort Benning. Did you like Columbus? Fort. Moore I've Benning. never been to Fort Moore or any or Fort Benning or anything like that. Uh, I can't comment on that honestly. Uh, unknown. So, bro, they're making the Navy weak with less cursing. You're actually not really supposed to curse in uniform. It's only seen okay sometimes it's like kind of just you're you're really not supposed to you can get in a lot of trouble for that yeah you could i do it anyways but you know they always say do what your rank can handle and my ha my rank can handle a lot sometimes so <laughs> uh indiana said you did good it was something new they never had a person come and talk about serving well yeah um i will go check my dms after this and um i will hook you up with because there was a couple other people who were like interested and they, they dm me directly and I have a direct contact uh, contact with like the best recruiters out there, so I'm I'm like really trying to hook you guys all up because you guys treated me so nice, and uh, it was awesome. But again, I'm probably gonna do a separate video on it. Um, I appreciate the feedback. Like I said, I've actually never done that before, and it was really cool to meet all you guys. That does sound pretty fun, man. Yeah, this is my other boss. Everything these days <laughs> is making the USA weak. Uh, I'm trying to get my citizenship before I come to the US. Yeah, you need that to join the army or you need a green card at least because uh, yeah I... uh, you don't necessarily have to have citizenship to join but again if if citizenship is that important to you that you want to get that first completely respect that for sure out of curiosity in case of all-out war what's the army's policy for like getting fat dudes into tanks if you're a civilian maybe reserve and aren't fit for well um we have a really good reserve component let's just put it that way a lot of people we make fun of like overweight soldiers uh, we probably have the strongest and most capable reserve component outside of the reserves and National Guard. Like, the amount of veterans who would go back for a legitimate conflict, we would we would smash people. Yeah, for lack of a better word, they're our scrimmage team. Um, the guy who talked at the beginning, he wasn't a drill sergeant. Um, they're actually talking about Sergeant Benj, Jad. Oh, okay. We all work together. Um, he's actually in charge of the entire unit um, out there. And uh, he has a lot of pull, and I'm really good friends with him. And like I said, I I'll hook you up with him and make sure that you get the best option and the best quality for, like, what jobs you want and don't want. But, uh, yeah, he that's uh, that was also my former boss. Yeah. Uh, a couple more questions, and then we're, we're going to kick off of this. And maybe we'll just – maybe we'll make this a reoccurring thing. <laughs> yeah, maybe. All right, here's one more question. What do you think might happen to the military in the future? Would it stay long – would it stay longer or would the world be... No, we're always going to have a military. It's never going to go away. Yeah. Because the military is not only for combat operations. It's also to help uh, people with humanitarian humanitarian aid. Yeah. Oh, no. Someone asks, are barracks bunnies real? Yes. Did, do or did you like them? I stayed away from them as much as possible. Uh, and yes, they are. But that's also with any job, to be honest with you. But yes, they were a thing. Uh, grease the sides of the door and push them in. Agreed. You know we love the live streams. Yeah, live streams are fun. 
Please do more videos. I enjoy them. Yeah, again, this account is demonetized, so um, I'll probably be doing it on the second account, or we might do it on Patreon. Pinned link if you guys want to support. Okay, that sounds good. How about military police? I know Air Force has police. How about U.S. Army, and how is their training compared to regular ones? Uh, U.S. Army gives you more opportunity. So, like, even if you hate the military police, you can get into special operations and, like, psychological operations. But that's why I always say, and I'm not trying to be biased, but... The Air Force caps you at E6. Every single person's like an E6 in the Air Force. In the Army, you can go in as military police. If you hate it, get out. But you can keep going and progress and progress and then change job paths even if you want to. In the Air Force, it's pretty difficult because they're so standardized and the training is so long per specific MOS. And uh, as you remember when I talk to you guys in person, I always have a backup plan. And the Army is full of backup plans even if you hate your job. Yeah, that's for, 100% for sure. If you do go... MP uh, in the army, you'll be uh, doing your, I, I don't know if it's one station unit training uh, in so. Fort Leonard Wood, but I know the AIT of the military police is is in Fort Leonard Wood. So you would be where I'm actually yeah, training actually, other You'll soldiers. see Jad. So if you go military police, we'll hook you up. I, I guarantee we can get you that job. Yeah, you'll, probably. you'll be working with Jad. <laughs> or at least seeing Jad. You're you'll gonna... probably see me. You won't work with me. You'll be arresting Jad. <laughs> yeah. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, right. Um, Indiana. Um, I'll go check my DMs after this. Anybody else want to join the army, DM me on uh, Instagram. But <laughs> um, All right, guys. That was pretty much it. Maybe we'll do more of these. I'm going to be posting this. You guys want to go comment and like the video. That helps. I have Patreon pinned link if you want to go support the channel there. And uh, I'm on TikTok more, so yeah, TikTok. All right, much love, everybody. Thank you, Jad, for being here. I'm happy to be here. See you guys. Love you.